You know, it's not related to this episode, but the more I hear this song, the more I don't like it. This might be a bit of a nitpick, but I don't like Blake and Yang's running animation. I don't know, there's something about it. Maybe their backs are too, like, straight upward. Because usually when you're running, it's like more like a full tilt that happens with your back or something like that. I don't know, maybe their knees are too high. And there's something about it. There's something like I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, something looks weird. It's not bad. It's just something that makes my head go... What is that? What is something about that? So, the Grimm are never a threat. They never feel like a threat. But I will say, it's really cool that the Goliaths have been the only Grimm to actually feel like they can cause some damage. Like, other than, you know, the obvious really, really big ones. Like, the normal Grimm, the Goliaths have been the ones that, even back when we first saw them, I was like, ooh, those are creepy. And now seeing them, like, actually rampaging through a town, yeah. They, th these are the only Grimm that feel like they would be able to cause substantial damage and wouldn't be super easy to dispatch, like how the Beowulfs or Ursa usually are. Of Salem. He's doing it. Why do you care? <clears throat> okay, so Ruby in this entire volume, I'm so disappointed with what they've ended up doing with her character. The entire element about lying to him feels completely worthless, because she almost immediate. I liked the idea of her like debating with herself, you know, really stepping into Austin's shoes about when is it worth it to keep secrets? Because as they all got super pissed at him, like, you've been keeping secrets. And like, well, yeah, you don't know who you can trust. Sometimes you have to keep secrets. And I liked the idea of Ruby debating with herself and talking to others about what it, if she's doing the right thing or if she's just as bad as what she perceived Ospin, or if they should maybe forgive Ospin for some of the secrets he kept. But it's been completely dropped, and now it's just, yeah, yay, he's telling people, and I'm happy about it. I will say, I, I'm happy that everyone is very accepting of Salem's news, at least from what we see in this episode. I was expecting it to be just like Ironwood predicted. Everyone panics, and then this big whole thing. But uh, I'm, I'm glad it helped them, like, unite, and I, I think it helped that he did have Robin with him, and it helped them, like, really understand the, the, the grandiose nature of what he's telling them. So yeah, I, I liked that they all were cool with it, because it can't get much shittier than where they are right now. I just wish that- I wish that keeping it a secret was actually worthwhile in the long run. Like, there was any consequences to anyone keeping these secrets, because it's been completely dropped. Which I'll get back to in a second. Okay, so I've been pretty clear in the past that I've never been super amazed by Jessica Negri's performance as Cinder. I think she does a really great job here, though. Still can't believe those idiots beat us here. Like, I can I can tell she's been trying before, like throughout volume six. It, the problem is she doesn't really get a whole lot to work with, and she tends to just default. Once the character defaults to the same position she's always been in, then her vocal performance also tends to just default to the same, like, sultry, belittling tone that she uses. But I really like the scene, because you can tell how much better Jessica has gotten at voicing Cinder. And Cinder, I think it helps because Cinder gets to be like a character. She's clearly frustrated, she's pissed off, she's thinking, and you can tell like she's really trying to plan ahead. And she's acting like, I could say leader, but it's more like a commander. She's not leading Neo, she's co making commands. And uh, I like this. I like Honestly, this scene between Neo and Cinder is probably my favorite in the episode, and it's this plot point of whatever they're gonna do is the thing that I'm most intrigued by moving forward. I also think, like, it's cute. Like, uh, with Neo, when she, she asks, what about Ruby? Though in order to ask that, she does, like, a shrug and looks like Ruby. I like that. Something a little clever like that. Like, using her semblance to help say something that she can't because she is mute. That's just a really nice little scene, and I, I like what we're doing with Cinder and Neo. I hope they don't fuck it up. <laughs> this is something I, I really like, that uh, they're hinting at Ruby still needs to learn how to do her silver eyes better. Um, I felt like she beat the Leviathan a little too easily last time, but uh, this scene is actually pointing out a lot of things that I didn't think about, about how she beat the Leviathan last time. In order to make her silver eyes work, she needs to stand almost completely still, and she has to really, really, really focus. And it worked last time, because she was able to slow down time with Jin, but as we see here, she doesn't always get that luxury. And I like that it's not like an immediate, like, bam, flashing eyes everywhere, boom, boom, I'm as good as Maria used to be. I like that she does still need to grow and get better at that, and I like how this scene points that out to us. I something I think it could be interesting is that Ruby struggles to think about these things. Like, you can tell she's focusing a lot to try to think about that, those happy moments, the people she wants to save. Which is a bit of- I, you could go into a really interesting character deep dive with that, I guess. Uh, 
I don't know if it's true or not, but you could really theorize that Ruby is fun and bubbly on the outside, while on the inside she's actually a deeply sad and maybe depressed person. She just keeps it bottled up. But uh, that's that's all theory, and I'll leave that to the theorists to figure that part out. I think I have a plan. What is it? Okay, that was cute. <laughs> Holy crap, that was amazing! That was probably the coolest way they've ever killed a Grimm. Uh, fucking forget the decapitation from volume one. This shit. This is the cool shit. <laughs> it wasn't finished. It was bait. Alright, this was something I really liked. Like, earlier in the episode, Ironwood's like, you know, we finished the tower. And I, I honestly, I was gonna nitpick about it, because uh, I was sitting there thinking, that doesn't make sense. Last time we checked, you hadn't finished it yet, and you were bitching that we couldn't finish it on time. And I like that it was just a trap to lure Watts to him. And I really like that. It proved me to be a dumbass, because I didn't think about that. <laughs> I just dived right in, ready to complain about something. I should give them a bit more credit. Oh, what's that? Is my prophecy coming true? I'm gonna call it right now. The final fight of the volume is gonna take place on Amity Gallicium. Let's put it down in the history books. This is what I'm, I, I declare. This is my prophecy. Hark, I am the prophet, and I predict all things 100% correctly. Don't- d definitely all the time 100% correctly. <laughs> Oh, cool! They finally get to use like the anti gravity field. That was something you c you can notice it in the background when in Volume Three, when Penny and CL are like kicking the crap out of whatever Team Cardinals guys were. Oh, uh, you can see it in the background, and it's something that they talked about in the director's commentary that they had planned this whole thing with a two v two fight with Sun and Neptune versus Nora and Pyrrha, and they were going to use that anti gravity arena, like part of the field, but it ended up getting scrapped, and I like that now we get to finally come back to it and use the anti-gravity. It's a nice, like, getting to use the setting again means that they gotta go back to that idea and really flush it out a lot more and, like, bring back those ideas, and it's really awesome. I'm actually very excited to see what they do here. Oh damn, this fight is gonna be amazing! I'm so excited! I can't wait to see what happens! What? What? Oh, are you fucking kidding me? I have a bit of a problem with this episode. So I said last time I wouldn't tolerate another setup episode, and that's basically what this is. It's better because it's not just standing around talking about shit. We actually got like, it, it was action all the way through. That's why my commentary was a little few and far between because I, other than saying that looked cool or that was weird, I don't, <laughs> there's not really a whole lot you can say about purely action scenes. And I had very little complaints about the actual episode itself, other than we got very little done. Like I said, that Cinder and Neo scene was my favorite part, only because I really liked what they're doing with the characters, and how they're being portrayed, but also that's the element that I'm most intrigued for. They're the biggest wild card right now, and I don't know what they're gonna do, and I'm excited for it. But they also- ugh, this entire episode was basically that- it, it was crowd control, you know. We gotta stop the Grimm, we gotta help people. The Robin and Ironwood scene was probably the most important, arguably, part of the episode. But yeah, it was just a minor like, yay, we did it. We, we told everyone. Woo, good job, team. I, I imagine watching it as a movie, like with the DVD or the Blu-ray, I watch all the episodes back to back as a movie. This episode would be a lot better because it's just showing the crowd control element. But having knowing I have to wait another week to see what happens, once again, I'm a little upset because and, I mean, it's not horrible. They just do that thing. It's such a classic Ruby thing, and I hate it that they do this all the time. Where they'll be like, "We're gonna start this fight," and then they cut away. And like this episode, we don't see actually that fight until next week. Being that being um the fight with Watts and Ironwood, and also the fight between Robin, Crow, Clover versus Tyrion. So you know. It was set up, it wasn't awful, it was at least fun to watch. You know, when I think about cool scenes, like throughout the Ruby universe, I'm gonna think about, you know, the reveal of Elms's missile launcher, or the way they killed that Goliath. You know, it was, it was fun. It was a good, fun episode, but as far as progressing the story or anything, pretty minimal. I will say I'm a little disappointed with the finale so far, because it feels oh so very familiar, and not like in an Ironwood was afraid this would happen kind of familiar, like this has been the finale 
five times now. So, volume two, volume three, volume four, volume six, and now here with volume seven, the finale has always involved fighting a grim. At least one really big one, or many, many small ones. So, it's a bit played out by this point. I, I, I find it hard to really get invested because I've seen this so many times, you know. They're gonna plow through the Grimm, they're gonna save the day. The Grimm isn't the threat. The, th the threat is whatever Cinder and Neo are planning. The threat is whatever Watts is gonna do fighting against Ironwood. That's the thing I care about. These characters is the part that is compelling and is a threat to me. The Grimm are just fight fodder at this point. It's I'm tired of it just being a shit ton of Grimm fighting our heroes. I'm just- I would like to see- It's- it don't, it's disappointing because I kind of expected this volume to be espionage mostly. You know, not big bombastic, there's monsters at the gates! Ah! You know, more like, you know, I'm sneaking around, I assassinate you. Like, we, we gotta fight, but we also gotta not cause a disturbance. Mantle and Atlas are already on the brink of fucking rioting to begin with. If we make them all panic, it's gonna bring the grim, so we gotta try to keep things chill. But that didn't happen. Which was obviously, you know, that was Watts and Tyrion's entire plan throughout this entire volume, but it was just a little... <laughs> it's predictable. It's the thing I expected it to be. You know, it's monsters running around, the knights and normal people can do nothing against them, and our heroes magically are very good at killing these things. Wow. I'm, I'm excited for next week. I wanna, cause I, we're wrapping things up and I'm expecting things to get like really, really fun and in interesting. Specifically, I wanna see the characters. Uh, we know where Robin, Crow, and Clover are with Tyrion, and we know where, you know, Watts and Ironwood are doing. But I'm wondering about the rest of the Aesops and Team Ruby slash Juniper, what they're gonna end up doing throughout the last three episodes of the volume. So I guess this episode wasn't awful. It was just, it was a fine, action episode, but I kind of wanted a little bit more. I want, I wanted like three more minutes to really like start the fight with either Tyrion versus the others or Watts versus Ironwood. Just, just to get like really whet my appetite with those fights. But you know, it wasn't awful. Uh, just a little down the middle. Uh, this was a very down the middle episode for me. So I guess that's all I have to say about that. Uh, I want to know your thoughts on the episode, since I was clearly very neutral about it. <laughs> Did you love it? Did you hate it? Why? Are you excited for the Watts vs. Ironwood fight? Or the Tyrion vs. the other guys fight? I want to know all your thoughts and answers, and any ideas at all, leave them in the comments below. If you want to help support me, I do have a Patreon. Uh, any and all support is greatly appreciated. Any amount goes a long, long way, and it makes you an awesome person. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.